Well, like I said, as we were just about to read this passage, we've been uh, visiting a lot with John the Baptist over these last several weeks. I, I, I hadn't really noticed that in years previous, that around this time there's so much emphasis on the ministry of John the Baptist, but we certainly have experienced that uh, these last five or six Sundays. And, you know, here's an interesting thing that sometimes happens. When we get to know someone fairly well, one of the things is that happens is that we get really used to their things that are unique and perhaps even sort of strange about them. You know what I'm talking about? You know, I, I, I have a friend, and, and we've been friends for over 30 years, and I forget sometimes how strange that friend is because I've just gotten used to it. The, my times when I remember that is if I happen to introduce him to someone else and, and then he goes into his usual thing, which is that when he meets people, he just starts asking them question after question after question after question. He doesn't stop. And some of the questions that he asks are ones you might expect that a person who's just meeting you would ask. But some of them, are, you know, aren't quite like that. They're a little strange. And, and as I'm watching this, I'm saying, oh my gosh, I remember now how odd this fellow is. We're good friends. He doesn't mean anything by it. But, but how odd this fellow is. And, and I probably should go and tell this other person afterwards, you know, that's just this person being this person. That's just what they do. They don't mean any harm. But when we get to know somebody and we start getting comfortable with them, we, we kind of don't pay attention as much to the, the things that are a little bit unique and, and in fact, strange or odd about them. Amen? Amen? And they do the same for us, which is nice. So the thing is, is that with John the Baptist is that when we have heard so much about him and we think we're getting to know him, one of the things that might happen is that we forget how strange this guy is. He's a strange man. And, 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 and you can only imagine how people would react to him. And when I say he's a strange person, uh, well, one of the things that we need to say about that is that of course he's strange. He's a prophet. Prophets are strange. Uh, and and, and let, me, let, me, let me show you what I mean. Uh, you have, for example, in all throughout the Bible, examples of prophets that behave strangely and, and do strange things. If you look at the Old Testament, for example, you find Ezekiel, who begin, Ezekiel, who begins his prophetic career by eating a scroll that he has been given to given that has been given to him by God. That's kind of strange. And then later on, he, 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 is, uh, he is told to give a message to the people from God. And then what he's supposed to do is he's supposed to go out into the middle of the town square and lie down on his side and give this message while he's laying down on the ground. And that he's supposed to do this for 430 days straight to symbolize the number of years the people of Israel and Judah had spent in sin. What, what would you think if I decided one morning I was going to give to you the sermon laying down on my side? Kind of strange, right? Even for me. Or, or, or we look at the prophet Isaiah, who, you know, is a pretty influential prophet, but... God once instructed him to strip off all his clothes and wander through Jerusalem naked and barefoot while giving his message. No <laughs> and, and, and he has to do this for three straight years, walking around naked. What if I came to church and decided today, today I'm going to preach naked? Well, you'd think it was a little strange, right? Well, you know, meanwhile, the book of Isaiah, Hosea, rather, kicks off with God telling Hosea to marry a prostitute, which he goes and does. And the purpose of that is that that's a message that 
is he want, that God wants to send through not just the words, but the actions of this prophet so that the people would understand that for like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. Prophets are strange. Their words and their behavior are unsettling. And that was no less true of John the Baptist than it was of any of these other prophets that we're talking about. John the Baptist, if we don't forget all of these things, is an unsettling presence. Now, the thing about John is that he's sort of the prophet's prophet. I mean... In fact, John is so prophetic that he is prophetic even in his mother's womb. Do you remember the story from a few weeks back of how when Mary had found out that she was pregnant with Jesus and she went to go see her cousin Elizabeth and Elizabeth is the, the mother of John the Baptist and the Bible tells us that as soon as Mary comes into the presence of of Elizabeth the, the child in Elizabeth's womb that's John the Baptist leapt within him, her because he immediately even though both of them were in their mother's womb recognized Jesus as the person who had been awaited for so long the Messiah I mean John uh, I'm sorry yeah John the Baptist was a was a prophet in utero. Now that's pretty impressive, right? And pretty strange. And it only gets more strange and remarkable as time goes by. He comes of age in the Judean desert and then he storms out of the wilderness with a, a one-point sermon ringing across the Jordan. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And all the while he's dressed in this strange camel hair with a leather belt and he's eating bugs and he's doing all, you know, and, 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 and he gives this, like I said, this one point message. Repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. God's messenger is on his way with judgment for all. He will gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And even though John's message is unrelentingly frightening, and repented, the crowds flock to hear his message. They flock to the wilderness to be baptized him in the River Jordan, confessing their sins. This is, if we're not, if we're forgetting how used to this we all are, this is strange stuff. One modern day Baptist preacher speaks for a lot of us. He says, as a child, I was terrified by John the Baptist. He seemed lean and mean, direct and outspoken, like most of the Texas evangelists I grew up hearing, a revival preacher in camel skin. My grandmother told me we had to like John. He was a Baptist, after all. <laughs> and he goes on to tell the story of the two frontier preachers who were arguing over whose church was the most biblically correct. The Baptist preacher, feeling himself bested, finally exclaimed, well, they didn't call him John the Methodist, did they? <laughs> anyway, like I said, if we're paying attention, if we're moving through our familiarity and, and continuing to pay attention, John the Baptist should probably still scare us. In fact, he and Jesus both force us to ask, what makes a prophet? What in the world is the prophetic? And, and how do we discern it? Who is a prophet and who is not? And, and how do you know the difference? When, when do prophets speak for God and when are they just plain crazy? Then and now pursuing this thing called the prophetic is, is dangerous business. There's plenty of prophets or self-proclaimed prophets even today. And not all of them are real. Not all of them are authentic. Many, many of them are false. And it's 
hard to tell the difference sometimes. But how do we know? How do we take the difference and make, make up in our own minds? Oftentimes, prophets go unrecognized and unheralded while they are alive. And only after they have gone do we see, oh yes, that man was a prophet. And, and at the same time, many who make a splash and gain a following in their own lifetime are, are revealed eventually to be false yeah. teachers. How? How do we tell the difference? How do we do that? I don't, I, 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 there's no, no easy answer to that question. Except to say that prophets usually act the way you wouldn't ever think a prophet to act. That's usually a good, one good sign. <laughs> but there are a few things that we can't say are char characteristic of the prophets that we see in, uh, in the scriptures that can help us in our quest to pursue the authentically prophetic. One of the things, for example, that we see from John's ministry is that a true prophet is usually someone who cannot keep their mouth shut and who does not speak one way to one group and another way to another. One of the things we see from John's ministry is that, that John is someone who will not and cannot keep silent. He has what some preachers call a fire in his belly or, or a fire in his bones. He must keep talking and speaking his truth no matter who does or doesn't like it, who hears it, and who rejects it. John's message has no filter whatsoever. Even snippets of his sermon should make us squirm. You brood of vipers, he said to religious people, just like us. Who warned you to flee? from the wrath to come. Or that he stuck truth to power to Herod and Tippas. He said, it is unlawful for you to have your brother's wife. He actually expected a leader to be a moral person. And he stood up against, uh, he went putting himself on a collision course with those ruling families who think that they, unlike the rest of us, are ethically immune. And, and, and if you read the rest of the story in his relationship with Herod and Tippus, he winds up in jail and then he winds up losing his life in gruesome, gruesome circumstances, all because he was willing to speak the truth to him. So one thing is that Prophets boldly speak a truth that is not easy to hear, but that they must speak. They have a fire in their belly. Another thing that is true of many prophets is that they foretell the future. Everybody kind of knows that. We all, in fact, for most people, if you ask them that a prophet does, that's usually the only thing they say. Oh, they foretell the future. And it's true that Biblical prophets often do tell the future. They, they can see what lies ahead and, and they see, feel a, a burden from the Lord to share words of warning that if people keep in the same direction, terrible things are going to happen. You see, most of the time when they warn, they're, they're, they're not saying that this is a done deal, that these terrible things I'm telling you are bound to happen. What they say is that if you do not change, if you do not repent, if you do not hear the word of the Lord and take the uh, time to, to say, what does this mean for how I should live? If you just keep doing the same old thing, yes, this is what's going to happen. And oftentimes the things they predict are terrible. And, and, and horrible to consider. But, but, he, but, it, but most of the time, they're doing this not just to say, oh, well, this is what's going to happen, but to say, if you do not change, but if you do, there is a chance that things will change. Right? And I think of the, the prophet Jonah for as an example of that, who, who, who very unwillingly went to the, the uh, city of Nineveh to bring a word, and that word was a, a harsh word that, that God was going to destroy this city. 
because of the wickedness of the people. And, 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 and the reason that Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh was because he was afraid that if he brought that message, the people of Nineveh would hear and they would repent and they would change and God would spare them. He didn't like the Ninevites very much. <laughs> and so he goes to the town of Nineveh and after some persuasion <laughs> in the form of a whale or a big fish. But he goes to the town of Nineveh, the city, and he gives the message. And guess what happens? The people do indeed hear his message. And they begin to reform and they begin to try to start treating each other better and they begin to honor God. And, 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 and that changes God's mind. But God decides not to rain fire and brimstone down on them. And, and again, Jonah is disappointed <laughs> about that. But, you know, he's doing his job as a prophet. Another thing that prophets often do that we can perhaps tell that this makes them more authentic as a prophet is that, is that they don't so much tell the future as much as they read what's going on now in a deeper way than most people can. They seem to know the heart of people because God is speaking to them. They're speaking a message from God that says, I know that these things that you have hidden from other people, these charades that you are putting on, this hypocrisy, I know what you are doing. I know what you have done. And believe me, God is not pleased. And it will not go unnoticed. A good example of this from the Old Testament is the prophet Nathan, who was a prophet during the time of King David. And, and some of us know the story of King David, how he entered into an adulterous affair with a woman by the name of Bathsheba. David himself was married, so was Bathsheba. And the result of their uh, illicit connecting with each other is that Bathsheba becomes pregnant. And, and in order to save his own skin and, and to keep his sin from being found out, he sends the, the husband of Bathsheba out into battle on the front lines to make sure that he kill, is get, gets killed. He essentially had, had the, a, a contract put out on the husband and, and had, him, had him killed. And he thought that he had gotten away with this. He thought that, that no one was going to hold him accountable for this. He, he thought that everything was cool. And then this prophet by the name of Nathan comes to him. And it's a, I can't go into everything that he says, but he, he, he tells a story that helps uh, David know, uh, know uh, my sin has been found out. And I need to answer for it. So they not only foretell the future, but they tell the truth about what's happening now in a deep way that, that doesn't allow hypocrisy and, and, and all of that sort of thing to stand among leaders, whether they are religious or political. But even with these guidelines, and, and there are some others. Oh, I, I should say one last thing that the prophets often do. And that is that prophets often, in spite of the sense that we have that it was always telling, so, saying so much doom and gloom and destruction, oftentimes prophets bring words of comfort and hope. I think of Isaiah, that famous passage from Isaiah where he says, Comfort me, comfort my people, says the Lord. And, and, and we see that from time to time in the prophets of God sending through them a message of hope and of comfort, especially for those who are downtrodden. Now here's where it gets a little bit difficult because you know what? A word for hope for, uh, for someone might not be such a good word for another person. <laughs> right? I mean, what's good news for some folks Sometimes it's bad news for other folks, right? And, 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 and oftentimes, 
we, we hear people say things like, well, that the role of the prophet is to comfort the afflicted and also afflict the comfortable. <laughs> and so, even though we know that the, it's, it, these messages are meant to be comforting to the folks who are, who are under trod underfoot and, um, and trod downtrodden and, and who feel powerless, that the messages of hope and saying, I haven't forgotten you. It's going to be all right. But that winds up also being experienced as bad news for the folks who are keeping them down. And so the message is both comforting and dangerous at the very same time. So, so the prophetic, that's another thing that happens, is words of comfort for the afflicted and oppressed. Now, even with all these guidelines, it's still no easy or obvious thing to discern the real prophets from the false ones. In the verses just ahead of today's gospel reading, if you have a chance, look ahead, or be behind, I should say, before the passage. John the Baptist undergoes some examination on the part of some of the religious leaders. They want to see his prophetic credentials. They, they ask him, are you the Messiah? Are you Elijah? Are you a prophet? And each time he says, no, I'm not those things. He finally says, no, I'm none of those. But I am a voice crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. Now the interesting thing is that the leaders were right to question him. We should always check someone's prophetic identification credentials before we go off with them and, and follow them or go with them to change or destroy the world. The word, world stage is littered with false and would-be prophets. And we want to test the prophets. On the other hand, sometimes we just know when we come across the authentic. And that was the case with the disciples, wasn't it? If we read further on in our passage, we understand that they pursued the prophetic in Jesus, didn't they? And, and today's lesson from John shows the direct and indirect implications of their pursuit. Some of the verification that allowed them to make the decision to leave everything and follow Jesus was public and kind of obvious with the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and remaining on him. But then there was this little, wonderful little line from Matthew 139 when telling the same story that says the disciples came and saw where Jesus was staying and they remained with him that day. And what we find out as we read from John is that whatever Jesus did or said by four o'clock that afternoon Andrew announces to his brother Simon Peter we have found the Messiah. The apostolic community was born in a day-long seminar. <laughs> it didn't take long. And we are called to pursue the prophetic just like the disciples did. Even with all the danger, the difficulty, the potential for being taken in by false prophets, we still must decide who we will follow. We must be careful, we must use wisdom, we must check credentials and follow the guidelines that we see in the scriptures. But we cannot allow ourselves to become paralyzed so that we don't make any decision whatsoever. Because as we often try to forget, not to decide is to decide. Sooner or later, we need to commit and step out in faith, trusting that God will direct us, and that even if we do temporarily get led astray by one false teacher or another, God will lead us back onto the path. So this question this morning is this. Are you pursuing the prophet? Are you willing to step into a relationship of trust. <clears throat> or are you stuck in fear? Or worse, indifference? 
Will you hear the word this morning that indeed we have found the Messiah? And will you take the risk of following him? Amen. Amen. Amen.